The Living Zen Podcast is a gift from the members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center to you. If you enjoy it, please be sure to let your friends know about Living Zen. If you'd like to support our community, here are a few ways that you can do it. Download the Living Zen Podcast app for iPod, iPhone, or Android. You can also purchase additional Zen Talks by Venerable Eshu on iTunes or Amazon.com. One of the most meaningful ways to show your support is by joining our Sangha as an associate. Your commitment of $10 a month will ensure that offerings like the Living Zen Podcast and our online eZendo will continue to be available around the world to everyone with an interest in truly living Zen. To become an associate, please visit our website at www.zenwest.ca and click on the membership tab. Thank you for your support. Uh, in the interest of not uh, injuring anyone tonight, I think I'll I'll try to cut as quickly as possible to the to the core of what I want to talk about tonight, which is uh, which is what I guess it's just practice, as always. This thing that we engage in, this activity that we engage in, uh, is aimed at realization, at the experiential realization of liberation. Liberation from suffering, as it's sort of phrased in Orthodox Buddhism. One of the ways that we really immerse ourselves, or one of the ways that we really ensure our suffering, our own suffering and the suffering of others, is the way that we very tightly, very tenaciously grasp onto uh, the idea, the concept of self, an I, a me, that stands separate and opposing, facing, outside of everything else that we come into contact with, everything else that we make relationship with, everything else that we uh, will run into in this world, objects and people, situations. The more firmly we engage and, and uh, fixate on this idea of a self that is solid and fixed, separate, the more we suffer. This is the foundation position of the, the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, the teaching of the historical Buddha. And so... Uh, I think that if we investigate this, if we look at the world around us, we can see that there are so many problems that arise from this grasping, this fixating of a self, of a, an ideal, of a position. So much trouble comes from fixating and standing up on this ground that we call right or good or justice. Because no matter how wonderful we uh, think this position is that we take up, there is this one piece that we're always standing up on the ground which is subjective. It's a one-sided perspective. Just looking out these eyes, this uh, position seems just. And whatever position that we take, it's always possible that somebody sees it from the other perspective. And so they stand up on the ground looking out from their perspective and they say, no, no, I'm right. And then when these two people in these two perspectives, these opposing uh, perspectives meet, we have a conflict, we have a fight, we have a war, we have suffering. So, I don't think this is anything new. This isn't news to anybody here, I don't think. But what I want to talk about is that this practice that we engage in here is not an intellectual pursuit. It's not a conceptual pursuit. 
It's not a, a means of understanding in an intellectual way these Dharma teachings or these uh, teachings of the historical Buddha and of all the teachers throughout the ages. It's not enough to know that what you're eating is poison if you keep eating it. It doesn't help. Oh, this is really bad stuff. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't help. So from the very minute, from the very moment that we walk in the door, the form, the structure, the activities that we engage in in a formal practice environment, in this community, in this Sangha, are aimed not at the intellectual understanding of the Buddha Dharma, of these teachings, but at at an experiential realization. At an experiential realization of unification. Uh, Another way of putting that is an experiential realization of harmony. When we come to the meditation hall, we come uh, out of this wonderful culture, this society, this world that we are all raised in and live in. And from the time that we're very young, we're encouraged to be individuals. We're encouraged to find ourselves, to identify ourselves, to shore up ourselves, to get more for ourselves, to clarify ourselves, to uh, specialize ourselves. And I think that this is an important practice to engage in all of these things. Valuable. Honing your skills and talents is a wonderful thing. Appreciating your unique situation and gifts is a good thing. The mistake that we make is when we take that identity, when we take that personality, when we take the situation that has arisen due to the coming together of millions of uh, circumstances, experiences, uh, opportunities, when we take this dynamic thing, this dynamic moment, this dynamic experience, this activity of self, and we make it into an object, we make it into a thing that stands separate, outside of everything else, this is where our suffering begins. So when we enter into the meditation hall, the first step that we engage in is the backward step. If we look at our lives, at at the way that we engage the self in our lives and in our culture and in our society as a plus activity. This is how I often refer to it. It's the activity of the wave arising from the surface of the water, growing, manifesting, developing. This is one side of the activity. When we enter into the meditation hall, we begin to engage in its, its opposite, the dissolution activity, the minus activity. Everything that we do is aimed at the experience, the realization of this returning to the origin, returning to the complete experience of what it is to be alive in this very moment. The gesture that we do when we walk into the meditation hall is to take two things, our two hands, which are uh, we take as separate, opposite, uh, two poles, left and right, and we bring them together as one, unifying them. We take the two directions, up and down, and we bow, bring them together, unifying them. This activity is not a religious, uh, spiritual, holy, divine, magical thing. It is a reminder. It is a very physical practice of bringing ourselves together, turning the activity from expanding outwards into the world to bringing back, to returning, to dissolving the minus activity, returning to zero. All of the activities that we do, whether it's chanting, whether it's sitting, whether it's walking, they're all balanced on this simple principle of harmonious functioning. What happens 
when instead of arising as an individual, instead of constantly doing what I want to do, we arise together with the content of this vast cosmos in this very moment. When it's time to sit and breathe, pay attention to our breath, pay attention to our posture, pay attention to how our environment is affecting us and how we are affecting the environment, bringing that into balance, allowing the I, I, I thinking to dissolve away. We come to a place where we experience ourselves, all of this room, all of this world as one. We notice that as we think of I, it becomes more difficult to rest in this experience of harmony, of unity. When we chant, if we allow the subjective self, if we allow the separate self to dissolve, to rest, we find that we find our voice beautifully. We find that we're able to harmonize with this whole cosmos in this activity of chanting or humming or ah. But the moment that I thinking arises, the moment that I step back out of the activity that I'm engaged in, we find it difficult. We become self-conscious, interesting term. When we engage in this practice of walking meditation, again, just keeping in step, close behind in a physical relationship with the person who is in front of us, being aware of the person behind us and how they're walking, allowing ourselves to dissolve into this harmonious function, this harmonious activity of walking, is not difficult. We find it very easy when we just allow ourselves to go. This isn't a new skill. This isn't finding some new way of doing things. This is our very origin. This is our original home. And we just allow ourselves to dissolve into harmonious function, into unification. We dissolve and become one with the activity that's manifesting in this very moment. But as we walk, we find that I come up. We find that thinking about what I need to do, or what I like, or where I want to go, comes up. And the moment that we become aware of ourselves thinking, the moment we become aware that we've stepped back from the activity that we're engaged in, we look down, oh, we've fallen at a step. We look ahead, oh, a gap has opened up. I've lost relationship with this person who's in front of me. Why is this important? Why is this experiential realization that we, we develop, that we recognize, realize, uh, deepen in experience through practice important? I think on many people's Christmas lists, maybe not so much anymore because people just think it's ridiculous. Let's say, oh, what do I want for Christmas? World peace. Not world peas, but world peace. We have all over the world, in our families and in our cities and in our countries, these people who are facing one another, standing up on opposite subjective opinions and everybody thinking they're right. <clears throat> fixed in the position of self, we have over and over again a bitter argument, battle, war. This practice is important because if we cannot learn to sit in harmony, if we cannot learn to walk in harmony, if we cannot learn to raise our voices together as one in harmony, how can we ever learn to do these much more complex things? How can we learn to have a harmonious economy? 
The practice of harmony, of unification, the realization of peace doesn't start in the mind, in the intellect. I think peace is a simple concept grasp in our, in our minds. It arises out of this experiential realization of what it is to rest, to find our home in this very moment. That's all that's asked when you come here. That's all that's uh, required of you when you come into this environment of a meditation hall. Realize your original home. Realize who you truly are before the expansion. Uh, In the classical Zen text, they would ask, what is your original face before your parents were born? Before you became John, or Sally, or Tom. Who were you? Who are you? Where is your home? Thanks for listening to the Living Zen Podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.